You see, my presence here has been alarming to a couple of people around because I've been standing here screaming of excitement that I have a chance to review this motorcycle. In a quest to see whose Richard is the biggest, Kawasaki goes to its aeronautics branch and asks them, hey, can you design a propeller for me that I can create a supercharger unit with that can fit inside a motorcycle? And those in the aeronautics section of Kawasaki said, of course we can do that for you. And they did just that. They created a supercharged four-cylinder liquid cool 998 cc engine that in 2014 went into the Kawasaki Ninja H2R making almost 300 horsepower and the H2R's engine that majestic mystic 300 horsepower engine has been replicated and placed into the Ninja H2 the base model street legal version and the H2 carbon the carbonified version of the H2 that are both street legal but after a couple of years people start to slowly slowly show a bit less interest in the crotch rocket category of motorcycles they wanted something different they wanted something more comfortable for the roads they wanted something with a more upright seating position and they wanted something cheaper so Kawasaki came up with this the naked version of the Ninja H2 called the ZH2 Street Fighter now Kawasaki has a strong emphasis on the fact that you should shouldn't call this a naked bike because that's not a dignifying enough name they want you to call it a street fighter so you can go out there and fight streets yeah so today we're gonna take a look at this motorcycle wheel to wheel and everything in between and I'm gonna take you on a thorough tour of everything this motorcycle offers and then I'm gonna get it out on the road and ride it and at the end I'm gonna give it an Emmy score Now let's get to the heart of this motorcycle, this 998cc liquid-cooled four-cylinder supercharged engine that makes 197 horsepower at the crank and 101 pound-foot of torque and it is carried to the rear wheel with a transmission that is called a dog ring transmission. Now what is a dog ring transmission? You see, a transmission consists of multiple gears, each rotating at a different speed because of their different diameters. Uh, when you go from one gear to another, your ge gears must be able to switch speed from the gear you're going from to the gear you're going to. And this transition is done two different ways. Either you have a synchro mesh system, which is a series of gears between two gears that, is rot that are rotating at a different, at, at an intermediate speed between the two gears. Uh, faster than the gear you were in and slower than the gear you're going to or vice versa and this allows the transition of one gear to the other to be done more smoothly but since you have to go over more gears um, than if there were no gears transitioning this phase for you uh, you would have had a very jumpy gear shift so what you're gaining here is a smooth shifting and what you're losing is time now in a motorcycle like this which is all about performance time is of an essence so what happens is uh, Kawasaki engineers created this dog ring transmission well they weren't the first ones to create it but they have used it here essentially each gear has these massive gears that are far farther apart from each other and they allow you to go from one gear to the other gear with these thick heavy-duty gears that interlock and all of a sudden take you from one speed to the other speed without deteriorating and damaging the transmission what is the problem here well you have a less smooth shifting process than those synchro mesh systems but what is the upside there are no intermediate gears to go through so the gear changing is much faster which is the purpose of a performance bike like the zh2 as far as the shifter itself you do have Kawasaki's up and down quick shifter but the last Kawasaki motorcycle I had and had the upper and lower quick shifter function in it it would not really work well unless you were in a racing style of riding you were at high speed in low speeds it was really clunky we'll see on this one how it works while we're back here let's take a look at the rear suspension as well this is just show us unit track set up here it's gas charged and there is nothing really advanced about it it's just a regular shock that was also on the ZX6 are and it makes an appearance on a ZH2 uh, 
The way to adjust this shock is just at the very top there are teeth that you can use a special uh, suspension wrenches to adjust some settings and at the very bottom there are some screws that you can adjust some preload on that as well. Other than that there is no knob or gear that you could on the fly adjust it and of course no electronic way of doing it. Now let's move on to the front wheel. You have this red rim that goes with the trellis frame on this motorcycle and this livery. The paint job here is black, gray and red which I think looks pretty cool cool. Uh, on this wheel is mounted a 120-70ZR17 uh, tire, again a standard tire, nothing special about it and uh, there are two 320 millimeter rotors and you have the Brembo calipers. Now when you look at this Brembo caliper what you notice is it's kind of a subpar job for this caliper and that's because when a manufacturer goes to a high-end company like Brembo and asks for calipers, Brembo gives them the option in high quantity. If you order like 600,000 brakes from me, I will make some cheaper calipers for you specifically, more economically built, um, and then you can buy those in bulk at a cheaper price. So what you see on this motorcycle, although it's Brembo, it is not really as pretty looking and as fine finished as you would see like on an MV Agusta. The front suspension on this motorcycle is just the inverted show up forks with manual adjustments at the top. Um, this is getting to a price point where you kind of want to start seeing electronically adjusted suspensions, but I think all the money you spend is just going to the supercharger and not the front fork. And now one thing about the front wheel is that I'll show you on the other side. It has a sensor for ABS. The sensor is just a wheel sensor, the wheel motion sensor, uh, but it is linked to your ABS system. Uh, ABS is also available on the rear wheel, but the front one actually has something better than just the ABS. Um, it has KIPS or Kawasaki's intelligent anti-lock brake system, a even though there's no A in there. Um, that's what it stands for. And what it does is it monitors more than just your brake input to activate ABS. It looks at um, the throttle response, clutch response, and also the amount of hydraulic pressure in the hose to the caliper. All of that is monitored and the best course of action is picked by KIPS to be done to the front wheel. Now let's move on to the rear wheel of the ZH2. Kawasaki strikes again with that slip-on they have put here. Um, they don't put much effort into it and that's a good thing because that keeps the cost down but they know once you buy this motorcycle the first thing you do is take getting rid of this and putting your own on. Um, but anyways behind that is that slip-on you'll see the rotor 260 millimeter rotor here and within it you see the sensor the motion sensor for the wheel which the ABS also gets some idea from. Um, uh, when the wheel is locked because the motion will stop and once that happens <clears throat> uh, the ABS kicks in and prevents your wheel from staying locked up. And while we're still back here it's also noteworthy that the rear brake is not Brembo it's Nissin brand which is again Kawasaki's more economic version of the caliper um, but We'll, we'll see on our ride whether it is doing an adequate job at being the rear brake or if we really need to upgrade to something better down the line. Now the tire here is a 190-55 ZR17. That's the tire that comes on ZX10R as well. So this bike, being a leader bike, is the same size rear wheel as the ZX10R and the same thing as the Ninja H2 and the H2 Carbon. Other than that, nothing special about the rear wheel. It's just a simple wheel design and the ABS that's on most other bikes at this price point. Now if you're ready, let's fire up the bike and take a listen to the engine and the sound of the exhaust on the stock setting and see if we can make the charger, the supercharger, whistle for us. Now what about some of the electronic features and rider aids that are available to you on this motorcycle? Well on the left hand uh, you can see the rider mode select. You can pick from some of the pre-selected modes for you. You have the road, race and rain mode and the fourth 
the rider mode, you can adjust the power delivery and the traction control on that. Other modes have those built into them. Uh, so that's one thing you can adjust on this motorcycle. The other one is good news on this motorcycle, you have cruise control. This is an electronic cruise control, just like a car. So you're not setting like a throttle lock so that the throttle input is at a certain distance. It utilizes the brake system as well. In addition to the cruise control here, you also have a Kawasaki launch mode, uh, you have the corner assist, and you have the Bosch IMU that has that five uh, axes multi-directional control and always knows what direction and what tilt and what angle your bike is at. In fact, on the screen, you can see bar, the tilt bar, that moves numbers as you tilt the bar to the left or right. Uh, again, I don't know how useful that information is while riding, maybe on the track people use that, it's like a G meter. Uh, so if you use that kind of technology, it is available on this motorcycle. And now let's talk about the design choices made here on this Kawasaki. For the Z line of motorcycles, Kawasaki has been using a term called Sugomi to describe the design they're doing. Now I don't speak Japanese but people who put that in the dictionary, um, they get a combination of meanings for this word. Perfect, aggressive, uh, beautiful, stuff like that. But overall, what Kawasaki describes that Sugomi word as is that a design that's beautiful yet aggressive. And that's what they've gone for this motorcycle. I see the aggressive. I'm not quite sure if I see the beauty. You see, motorcycles like this, Kawasaki's high-end motorcycles, like the H2, like the H2R, like ZH2, are either considered super pretty by some people or super ugly, and there's no in-between, really. It's a very controversial design. I think I prefer the Ducati Street Fighter's design over this one. It's This is a little too crazy, especially combined with this whole channel for the uh, supercharge that is on one side and not on the other side and the fact that on the front you have one fan that's wide open and one that's blocked off again because of that supercharged system that's on the it kind of loses that symmetry again some people really love that asymmetrical look that was also on the design of like the s1000 double r from bmw and some people complain that the bmw facelifted it to the 2020 model and on with that symmetrical design same here i assume if Kawasaki goes either direction, they're gonna receive some complaints anyways. So they they did this instead, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, this is the way it looks, and I think it looks interesting. As for the lights all around the motorcycle, the front headlight and the tail light are LEDs, but not the turn signal. You're gonna go ahead and put an integrated tail light into this motorcycle that shares turn signals and the brake light into one unit. And so that's forgiven. But for the front turn signals, you gotta have to upgrade those to LEDs. Kawasaki, I'm talking to you, because otherwise your customers will pay $20,000 after taxes and fees and out the door costs have bulbs there. That is not okay. That's especially that they are mounted on these stocks that are protruding out of the motorcycle. Again, not the best design for the turn signals. And now what about the options you have on this motorcycle? For the 2023 model, which is this motorcycle, this is the only color you can get from Kawasaki. Kawasaki calls it the metallic phantom silver and metallic phantom gray. The mix of these two colors and the red trellis frame. That's the only color and only configuration you can get it. There's no KRT edition for this motorcycle. Nothing available other than this one particular color. Another feature on this motorcycle is the Rideology app. The Rideology app that was introduced, I believe, in 2022 on some of Kawasaki's models and propagated to more and more models now, offers you the opportunity to pair your phone with your motorcycle and adjust some features so essentially this app makes the screen of your phone be the TFT dash screen. It just shows you the mileage, partial and complete mileage of your bike, how much gas you got in it, uh, where your bike is located, the lean angle, uh, all that data and telemetry is included in this app screen. So if you really just wanna have a view of what your screen looks like, but on your phone, this app is yours. And with that said, let's take the ZH2 Street Fighter out on the road and see how many streets we can fight. Okay, let's turn the bike on and show you guys the little show that the screen puts on. Bam, and you're, you're here. Let's get started. All right, we're on the rain mode. We always start on rain mode to get a good feel for the bike. And then we'll go through the modes more and more. Okay, let's see. And 
here we are this is how you would look on this motorcycle the thing is the height wise it's really tall this is how i uh, i'm five eight and this like this is how i am i'm like tiptoeing this bike usually a naked bike should not be this tall because it's uncomfortable but i can flat foot it if i lift one of my feet up uh, my my right foot up for example my left foot can now flat foot but otherwise i have to tiptoe this bike okay so let's go see what the zh2 is made of wow in rain mode and it is booking it so it's very very strong anyways let's take a look at the performance of this bike And it's on rain mode mind you and that lean sensor is pretty cool but pretty useless i still don't get the point of it but it's there i mean if you want to tell your friends your motorcycle has a lean sensor there it is the lean sensor right there <laughs> Why is the dash flashing at me, wanting me to change gear so bad? I'm literally beginning to be in the 40 mile per hour range and the, and the fourth gear is going crazy. Anyways, um, let's go down to the second gear. That's absurd. Whoa, whoa. This bike is fast. I'm afraid of... I'm afraid to get it out of the rain mode, honestly. It might get me in trouble. The front brake is a little spongy again, like the ZX6R. It's not biting hard enough. I'm gonna have to test the um, cruise control out there, see how it works. But the front brake is not satisfying. Again, I told you guys, it is Brembo, but Brembo's cheaping out on what's giving, what it's giving to uh, Kawasaki. The lights, uh, the cameras, I mean. Okay, so let's see. Let's go to third grade, uh, th third gear in uh, in 30 miles per hour and see if I can. Okay, so it says set on 30. Let's see if it breaks. Or maybe it just uses the engine brake as a braking mechanism. I mean, I'm not touching it, and we are at 31. And if I go to like. 30, 29, oh yeah, it is definitely utilizing the, the engine brake for braking, and it's doing a great job, actually, at keeping the motorcycle going at the speed I set, at 30, and it's just going 30, you just saw what an incline that was, the street I was coming down, and I even set it lower than what it was going, and it still worked, so, that's pretty good. I love this cruise control. Honestly, this is my first time uh, being on a bike with a cruise control. So that's interesting. And I like it. So let's change the mode to sport. Rain. Okay, come on, change the mode. That's, that's not an, oh, I know. I, I shouldn't be giving it throttle this way. Okay, so let's not give throttle and go to road and then go to sport. Okay, now let's see. Whoa! Wheelie, 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 yeah. Wheelie alert, wheelie alert. You guys hear it? <laughs> the supercharger spooling up and down. That is fantastic. Okay, I love this bike. It is a super comfortable seating position. Oh, oh, oh. This bike is <laughs> this bike is crazy. Imagine having the H2, the Ninja H2, and nakedifying it so that it all that power that the Ninja H2 is famous for is now in one spot focused in the down low end torque and the low end RPM. 
You just have to put your imagination to work and see what a monster we're dealing with here. Wow. This motorcycle is brand new and we are trying to keep the miles low on it for the owner who actually pays $20,000 for this motorcycle. And so I can't really take it out on the freeway and weave and go through the traffic and not that it's safe or legal, but uh, that's number one reason for me <laughs> that I don't, I don't want to put too many miles on this bike that they have graciously allowed me to have for a little while for you guys to see it up close and personal and see some of the tributes and quirks and features. So thanks to Bellevue Motorsports in Washington for allowing me to uh, have this motorcycle and share my thoughts with you. So finalizing my thoughts on this motorcycle. It is not as cool as the Ninja H2. We all know that and that's why it's almost half the price. It is as powerful, uh, at least coming out of factory until you ECU flash this thing that I can imagine, I cannot imagine. What kind of power are you going to get out of this with the ECU flashed and the slip on and, and, and perhaps even a full exhaust system on it? You're going to probably not going to, uh, you're not going to be able to control this motorcycle. Um, especially that in this configuration where the torque and the power is the low end style of tuning here. And I think, you know, it, it almost borderline makes an unsafe bike for the streets because every time you touch this throttle, the front wheel is up six feet from the ground. So you're going to be very careful you're going to have to be very careful with this motorcycle being in the streets because it almost makes the bike even more dangerous than just a regular h2 because the power band is spread on that bike throughout the whole range in this one it's focused down low where you are 99.9 .9 of the time so with that in mind let's go for the emmy score in the commuter category, the bike's riding position is very comfortable for inner city commute. Your feet are positioned almost directly down instead of to the back, which creates less body fatigue. The ZH2 earns a 6 out of 10. The fuel tank is big, holding roughly 4.5 gallons of gas, but as evident from owner forums, the supercharger takes a significant toll on the gas mileage, making the bike hover around 25 miles per gallon, earning the ZH2 a 5 out of 10. As far as commute-specific tech goes, the ZH2 has a fantastic cruise control and the Rideology app that can enable you to monitor details of your bike like how much gas is left, where you left the bike last, and what rider mode you were in, which is a nice touch earning the ZH2 a 5 out of 10. Storage is limited to under the seat only and is considered average for a motorcycle, but anything larger than a soda can, you have to bring along your backpack, earning the ZH2 a 5 out of 10. An important factor making a bike a great commuter bike is the cost-effective reliability and dealer network. The ZH2 is backed by a decent warranty and carries the credibility of Kawasaki's reliability. But being a supercharger motorcycle does hurt its reliability score a little bit as we have heard a lot of horror stories with the original H2's supercharger. Nonetheless, Kawasaki has a large network of dealerships in the US and earns the ZH2 a 6 out of 10. I would have given it a 7 out of 10 if it wasn't a supercharged bike. This gives the ZH2 a total 27 out of 50 points for the commuter category. In the performance slash dope factor category, the ZH2's upright commute riding style now becomes a slight downside in this category as the wind at high speeds can really bash you in the head and earn the ZH2 a 6 out of 10. Motorcycles with a more tucked in position score higher here. The horsepower figure is extremely strong as the ZH2 is almost unbeatable by any other street fighter in the horsepower slash torque department. With a claimed 197 horsepower and a 101 pound foot of torque, the ZH2 earns an impressive 9 out of 10. The ZH2 weighs a tremendous 525 pounds, one of the heaviest bikes I have test ridden, earning it a 3 out of 10. Kawasaki's focus must be putting the ZH2 on a diet. For reference, the Ducati Street Fighter V4 is almost 100 pounds lighter than the ZH2 at 444 pounds. In regard to the Rider 8's technologies, the ZH2 is loaded with some goodies, such as Kawasaki Quick Shifters, both up and down directions, launch control, cornering assist, lean sensor, radiology app, intelligent anti-lock brake system, and a Bosch multi-directional IMU earning a 9 out of 10. 
As for the ZH2's design choices and marketplace, it is an interesting looking bike, but I wouldn't call it a beautiful motorcycle. At the price of $18,500, it is out of the price range of a good portion of the population, which makes it a high-end motorcycle. Resale values are average on this bike, with some bikes losing almost 40% of the original MSRB after just three years, so it appears that demand is not too high for a used supercharged bike. With all of that, the ZH2 earns a 6 out of 10 in the Dope Factory. For a total score of 33 out of 50 in the Performance Dash Dope Factory category. And here is where the 2023 Kawasaki Ninja ZH2 fits on my spreadsheet. The ZH2 is a fantastic bike for those who want to commute short distances and love to do some hard pulls here and there. If you're looking for a street fighter and don't want to shell out more money for a Ducati for less power, the ZH2 is a great option if you can put up with the way it looks. But my assumption is that this bike will always live in the shadow of its more renowned brothers, the H2 and the H2 Carbon.